This is a quick guide to the Airco DH-2, a British single-seater biplane fighter of World War I. As the air war during World War I began to escalate, it became clear that existing aircraft were not up to the task. Initially, the purpose of these was primarily reconnaissance or light bombing, but it was obvious even before the war started that preventing these missions would be a priority. This is illustrated by the development of the Vickers FB-5 starting well prior to the commencement of the war from 1912. The FB-5 was not a significantly successful aircraft being the result of pre-war thinking, but nonetheless demonstrates that some kind of aircraft to combat other aircraft would be necessary and as such represents the world's first dedicated fighter aircraft. Pre-war thinking also envisaged fighters being distributed to reconnaissance squadrons in limited numbers rather than dedicated fighter squadrons. This was a policy that lasted until around the spring of 1916 and one that was disabused by the experience of the so-called Fokker Scourge that saw the German army achieve temporary air superiority, though they too were tending to distribute the primary means of this, the Fokker Eindecker, in limited numbers rather than concentrated force multipliers. The Eindecker forced a change in thinking on both sides of the conflict, and dedicated squadrons, or hunter-killer groups, were being assembled by late 1915 to early 1916. Additionally, the design of fighter aircraft was being changed in response to the experience gained in combat. Primary amongst these requirements was that the fighter should be a single-seater equipped with one or more machine guns firing forwards, preferably through the propeller arc. Also, it should be a biplane. Early experience with monoplanes led to a general consensus that they were not the best solution to lifting an aircraft into the air, despite the potential advantages of reduced drag and therefore higher speed. The problem was that existing aeronautical designs made a self-supporting single wing difficult to achieve, a problem that was easily resolved by a biplane. There was also the perception, somewhat erroneously, that stacked wings improved lift. They do, sort of, but not to the extent that was assumed. The French took all these lessons and came up with the rapidly evolving Newport 11, 16 and 17 series of fighters that ended the superiority of the Eindecker both in terms of improved speed, manoeuvrability and quantity. The British took all these lessons and came up with the Airco DH-2. Prior to World War I, the Aircraft Manufacturing Company, Airco, had been in existence since 1911, manufacturing Farman biplanes. Indeed, the influence of these can be seen in the DH-2, with its pusher design and bird's nest of bracing wires required to support the engine and fuselage located behind the pilot. By the beginning of the war, Airco had primarily assembled and tested Farman's ship from France, but manufacturing was starting to develop. Enter Geoffrey de Havilland. A flying enthusiast since 1908, he had by this time significant experience in aircraft design behind him and some successes in the form of the FE-1 and FE-2, which were developments of the basic Farman design. Farman aircraft were noted, as has been stated, by the location of the propeller behind the pilot in a pusher configuration. The FE part of the nomenclature actually means Farman experimental. Then employed by the Royal Aircraft Factory, he went on to design the BE-1 and BE-2 biplanes based on Louis Blériot's tractor approach to the location of the propeller, that is, in front of the pilot. BE, therefore, stands for Blériot Experimental. De Havilland favoured the tractor design and pushed forwards with it to produce the SE-2, which in 1913 achieved a speed of 91.7 miles per hour. Quite remarkable for the time. Circumstances resulted in de Havilland approaching Airco with regards to employment, and he began work for them in June of 1914. He began design work on tractor configuration aircraft, but this work was superseded by the Royal Flying Corps requirement for a pusher-type two-seater biplane equipped with a machine gunner for the observer. Probably with some reluctance, he nonetheless went forwards and by January 1915 had come up with the DH-1. 
The use of his initials for the naming of the aircraft was due to the policy of Airco and represents a nice gesture towards the designer. Airco, however, was unable to manufacture the DH-1 as they were committed to producing Farman-style trainers, so Savages of King's Lynn took over responsibility for production. Although de Havilland wished to continue with the design of tractor-style aircraft akin to the SE-2, the requirements of the Royal Flying Corps once again took precedence, requiring a single-seater pusher that could fire its armament forwards. One of the problems with a tractor design is the requirement for interrupter gear to prevent the machine guns from shattering the propeller. This is not an issue with a pusher. However, while patents existed for interrupter gear, one was not available to the Allies. Not yet. De Havilland basically cut down his design for the DH-1, converting it to a single-seater, which perhaps inevitably became designated the DH-2. The genesis of the requirements for this fighter aircraft are unclear. Given that it came off the design boards in March of 1915, the Fokker Eindecker was unknown, and it wasn't designed as a counter to that monoplane fighter. The Vickers FP-5 was only just entering service, so experience hadn't had the chance to generate feedback. Roland Garros' experimentation wasn't public knowledge yet either. Speculation is that either someone in the Royal Flying Corps, or perhaps de Havilland himself, appreciated the necessity for something faster and with the capability of forward-firing armament. I say capability because the DH-2 was designed for a Lewis light machine gun in a flexible mount to be controlled by the single occupant. In this it rather reflects the Vickers FB-5, though that was a two-seater. My guess, for what it's worth, is that it was an evolution of the FB-5, with which it shares a common layout and appearance, albeit smaller and lighter. In summary, the resulting aircraft was a pusher configuration, single-seater, biplane fighter. Its top speed was only 93 miles per hour, though it was to prove to be more maneuverable than the Fokker Eindecker. With wing warping going out of style, it used ailerons for lateral control, though the routing of the control cables was necessarily complex because of the pusher propeller. It is a shame that de Havilland was not able to continue the development of the SE-2, as the results might have been quite superior. The DH-2 first saw flight on June 1, 1915, piloted by Geoffrey de Havilland himself, who reported that it was somewhat tail-heavy and that the fin and rudder needed to be enlarged. Modifications were made to rectify this and subsequent flights received positive feedback to the extent that series production was ordered. The Royal Flying Corps test pilot, Captain Robert Maxwell Pike, who evaluated the aircraft, wrote that it was superior in speed and climb to any German scout, which was at the time a reasonable assessment. The Fokker scourge had not yet started, and it wasn't until a year later that an evaluation of the Eindecker could be made. That initial prototype was, rather surprisingly, shipped to the Western Front for combat evaluation, at which point it was promptly shot down and captured by the Germans, who appear not to have appreciated what they had laid their hands on and never flew it. The pilot was the same Captain Pike who had made the initial evaluation, and he had been shot through the head by the crew of an Albatross two-seater before he could report anything substantive about its performance. Nonetheless, production went ahead, though introduction into the field was delayed. It wasn't until January and February of 1916 that the first four DH-2s were issued to three squadrons for further evaluation. At the same time, thinking about the deployment of fighters had changed across the board, and as the Germans and French were starting to field entire squadrons of fighters, the first three squadrons of DH-2s made their appearance on the Western Front in March, April and May, respectively. 
While it has been said that the DH2 was responsible for or had a substantial role in the ending of the Fokker scourge, this seems to me to be something of an exaggeration. I think it is more accurate to state that once the new port fighters blunted the limited onslaught of the Fokker Eindeckers, the Airco DH2 assisted in maintaining air superiority until the next generation of German fighters arrived, at which point it was substantially outclassed. Its primary advantage in a dogfight appears to have been its manoeuvrability, even when its opponents were faster. Against the Fokker Eindecker it was only slightly faster, although its rate of climb was superior. However, the armament was markedly inferior, requiring frequent reloading in flight due to limited magazine capacity of the armament. Also, its mounting would have been deficient. Initially in a flexible mount, the DH-2 pilots quickly realized that it was preferable if it were fixed to fire forwards. The Royal Flying Corps was quite reluctant to permit this, and an operational compromise was reached wherein a spring clip was devised to hold the Lewis light machine gun in place facing forwards so that it could be released should the necessity arise. In reality, this rarely if ever happened. Sights to permit effective forward firing had to be improvised in the field. For six months, encompassing mid-1916, the DH-2 was an effective fighter. However, as new German fighters emerged, it was soon obsolete, though its superior handling qualities allowed it to remain competitive in a dogfight. Nonetheless, it soldiered on until the spring of 1917, by which point it had been replaced as a frontline fighter by the new generation of Allied aircraft. It saw a minor resurgence as a ground attack aircraft during the Arras offensive, as its forward view was superior to that of tractor biplanes. The last DH-2 on the Western Front was retired to the depot on July 1st. To give some idea of how fast the DH-2 was being superseded by superior aircraft, by summer of 1916, essentially at the peak of its success, it was already being used as an advanced trainer, a typical role for fighters as they became obsolete. It was still suitable for quieter arenas of the war, and saw service in the Middle East until early 1918, although it was by then completely obsolete, even compared with the second-line aircraft being fielded in the same arena by its opponents. Around 450 Airco DH-2s were manufactured and operated by 10 squadrons of the Royal Flying Corps. This compares poorly with the combined total of over 5,500 for the contemporary Newport 11s, 16s and 17s for roughly the same period of time, and illustrates that its influence over the air war cannot have been strategically all that meaningful, though its importance in terms of British fighter development was significant, especially in terms of advancing the career and reputation of Geoffrey de Havilland, who is of course more famous these days for the development of the Mosquito during World War II. No original Airco DH-2s are known to exist.